you very much to everybody for joining us. Sorry for the slight delay. Um, that was very un-German of us, but we'll try to finish punctual. Um, my name is Sebastian. Um, I'm a co-founder of the GABF, and um, I'm very honored to host this um, inaugural webinar of the Germany Africa Business Forum in partnership with uh, AOP webinars. Um, I'm very excited uh, to be discussing with a very distinguished panel um, on the business matters that are relevant post-COVID for German actors uh, and business, uh, business uh, co companies in, in Africa. Um, I'm going to hand over to my uh, friend and colleague from uh, AOP, Anin. She's going to give you a brief introduction uh, to the panelists as well as some uh, general housekeeping rules. And then once the Honorable Minister from Equatorial Guinea has joined us, he will also start with uh, addressing you all with a brief keynote. So I hand over to you, Anin. Thank you, Sebastian. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anine Killian. I'm news editor and head of publications at Africa Oil and Power, and I'm co-moderating the session with Sebastian. Um, we have a very strong lineup of speakers today, but before we introduce our panelists, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping rules for our audience on how to engage with the panel. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a few buttons. The first button is the chat box. Uh, that is there for you all to chat amongst yourselves. Uh, we have people logged on from all over the world, so please feel free to share where you're tuning in from and your thoughts on today's conversation as it progresses. Um, please do not ask any questions to the panel in this box. To ask questions to our panelists, you can see a dedicated Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please submit your questions here. Sebastian and I will be monitoring this box for your questions, and we will try and ask as many of your questions as possible to our panelists. Uh, the third button I'd like to draw your attention to is the hand icon. Uh, this is for members of the media. So if you are a participant of the media, please virtually raise your hand and someone from our team will set you up to ask your question to our panel live at the end of the session. Uh, the session is currently being recorded and will be available at the end of the webinar on AOP's YouTube channel. Um, before I introduce the panelists, is the minister, has he joined us? Not quite yet, but you can All go right. ahead. All right, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce the panel. Um, we have Mr. Ibrahima Mane, Director General for Cooperation and Financing from the Republic of Senegal. Uh, Ms. Onyeche Tifase from Siemens, Nigeria. Uh, Mr. Kenneth Reed from GIA Group and Mr. Tim Genagel from the Rwanda Development Board. So um, I think Sebastian, if you, uh, Thank you. would like to Go ahead. Um, while we're waiting for the minister, uh, I just wanted to address uh, the audience with a few opening remarks um, about um, why we believed this uh, webinar was uh, particularly important. Um, in an age of a, uh, how should I say, a state-run China, uh, a risk-willing India, and a very superbly supported France, um, how does a country like Germany fit into the picture um, in Africa in terms of doing business, uh, forging corporations and ties uh, with various African uh, business people and nations. And um, from the Germany Africa Business Forum uh, sites, we are a private think tank that believe in um, being there as a private for privates, supporting um, uh, this um, cooperation between Germany and Africa. Uh, however, um, today, I think, uh, while we're waiting for the minister, I'll be very honored to jump into uh, the panel with the, the minister, the, Mr. Director General, Ibrahim Mane. Um, I would like to you, sir, to ask you a few questions because I just mentioned that um, obviously one actor in, in, on the African continent is um, France. Uh, it's very well supported uh, domestically and uh, on its drive into into Africa and obviously in Senegal, uh, France's uh, French actors are very prominent. Um, Minister, Mr. Director General, I wanted to give you uh, the opportunity to briefly introduce yourself and maybe explain a little bit whether you have or have not in the past uh, seen German actors participating in business opportunities in the Republic of Senegal. 
So I hand over the microphone to you, sir. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, thank you, Anin. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, from wherever you are listening or following this webinar. I uh, would like, first of all, to thank the organizer of uh, this webinar and also express the satisfaction of being uh, in such a panel on behalf of Senegal. I would, uh, I would have also uh, conveyed my gre the greetings of, of the Ministry of Economy of Senegal and the regards to, its, uh, to the minister, Mr. Obiang Lima, from uh, Federal uh, Equatorial Guinea. Um, I would just like also before uh, answering the question um, to recall that, the, that Germany and, and Senegal has been you know, in a long standing partner. Uh, Germany and Senegal uh, commemorated their 50 years uh, of joint development cooperation in 2010. Uh, to date, the cooperation has mobilized uh, almost 1 billion of euros in funding. So uh, lately, uh, German uh, cooperation uh, and Senegal has been en enhanced, uh, especially in the uh, context of uh, uh, renewable energies, and also uh, lately also in the recent years with the compact with Africa signed in 2018. So uh, to answer to your question, yeah, we have a couple of examples of uh, you know, a, a fruitful and successful relationship between Germany and, and Senegal. Uh, this is mainly due to the type of uh, strategy that Germany has in terms of cooperation uh, with Senegal. I will be talking, I will be more focused on Senegal because that's the, the country where, where I am, but I guess it's the same, the same way of doing business and cooperation with the, the rest of Africa. Basically, what we could highlight is the cooperation is very rich in lessons uh, in terms of uh, the project or program uh, approach, uh, which is focused in, in sectors, and, but also the mode of intervention and implementation. Let me, let me, let me just illustrate it as, in, as a few examples. You will have GIZ and KFW. They are mainly, they, they mainly focus on the respectively on the technical cooperation and the other one on the financial cooperation. So GIZ, for example, would be intervening uh, upstream to create you know, the precondition uh, uh, for financial interve intervention leading to, to better project preparation, which is one of the main issues in Africa is you know, the, what I would just in a nutshell call the cost of development of project, which, which are not really bad by the public uh, funding. So the lack of means uh, sometimes, uh, why are we having like a good projects, but the lack of means makes those projects, you know, being having uh, lags and delays before they get, they get executed because the maturity is not there. For, for example, KF, uh, K, uh, KFW finance project, for example, studies are carried out, you know, uh, before the agreement is signed and an, an international consultant also will be recruited to support the implementation also of the, the structure. So that brings expertise also on top of what the local, uh, 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 the local you know, uh, expertise is here also. But an analysis of the technical capacities of each structure is being, is being carried out and to ensure that the, pro the proper project implementation. So this is the first uh, thing I would like to highlight on the, the way that we do in this cooperation with, uh, with Germany. The second point is the focus also on, on sector. So lately, I was, as I was explaining, Germany uh, been focused more on renewable energies. And with this more, for example, currently we have more than 200 millions of euros of project under, uh, ongoing, uh, under execution. Uh, and they are mainly focused on renewable energy, energy efficiency, and access to energy for the whole country. Uh, but also we would like to highlight the grant that we received last year uh, uh, to have a business environment, environment more attractive for FDIs. And with this, the Compact with Africa helped and basically it helped to finance uh, four major reforms in Senegal. 
The first one is, was the renewal of the labor code, uh, labor legislation and administration, which is a very old one. Uh, the improvement of the land management, the reform on the vocational training, and the access of financing for SMEs. So all of those are focused on, on SMEs uh, based on German, uh, Germany, uh, I would say, added value and experience and knowledge on those sectors. So this is uh, what I can say. And we have many examples of projects, for example, success in Senegal, uh, 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 thanks to Germany, it, 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 has, it has almost uh, supported almost 800 SMEs in, in, in Senegal. Uh, you know, the objective was to create new prospects of success for the youth and uh, including the returnees, people that are coming back to, to Senegal. So uh, we have also many other projects that I could list, but just to tell you that it is working very well between Germany and, and Senegal. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Director General. Uh, that's uh, obviously very, um, very encouraging, uh, those words coming from a traditionally more Francophone-influenced uh, 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 nation. Um, I think uh, I would like to touch on two things that you have mentioned, uh, which are obviously in a German context, me being German, um, uh, I, I, can, I, I can say for certain that uh, both the uh, SME involvement that you have mentioned, German SMEs involved in, um, in, uh, in the Republic of Senegal, as well as, uh, as well as the topic of renewable energy. Obviously, Germany, uh, which uh, has long been, for a long time, been a country mostly powered by coal, uh, has, uh, I think it was 15, 15 years ago or something like that, uh, completely uh, turned the switch towards the Energiewende, as we call it in Germany. And I think now Germany, Germany's uh, power is, uh, Germany's power mix is approximately 35, 40% renewable. So maybe, uh, Knowing that you are not, uh, you are here in your function as Director General for Cooperation and Finance uh, and not for energy and renewable energy, but maybe I think for our German participants, it would be very appreciated if you could highlight a little bit how German SMEs, especially in the renewable sector, have uh, influenced maybe uh, the Senegal Emergent plan that you have uh, in order to, let's say, move uh, Senegal towards the lower carbon future. I think that would be very interesting to all our participants, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to uh, recall uh, one of the uh, points I would say uh, always highlighted by Excellency President Macky Sall in terms of cooperation strategy. His point is, is to say no exclusivity and no exclusion, okay, and a win-win partnership. This is just to say that the probably the feeling of having uh, like a French, uh, a French, I would say, uh, 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 an, an energy sector, for example, dominated by the French investment, that's not really uh, the case. It's, it's a sector, for example, which is not dominated by, by, by one partner. There is, it's a dynamic sector where there is many, many other bilateral and multilateral partners that, that, is, that are financing uh, many of the IPPs, okay, in Senegal. So, uh, but moreover, uh, 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 Je Je Germany is making a major contribution in this sector, like you were just saying, in the field of the renewable energy. So we have uh, a list of many projects uh, in which German, uh, Germany, you know, finance. Uh, it's pr principally the uh, power plants, of uh, 25 mega, mega, megawatts implemented in, the, in, in some areas outside of the, the Dakar. So I would just recall that the Plan Senegal Emergent, which is the main plan for Senegal, is willing by 2025 to have 100% uh, electrification all over the Senegal. So those objectives right now, it's uh, the, rural, the rural areas right now are being electrified and for this, uh, we have many, many uh, projects that are financed by, by Germany. So German, German, uh, are more, uh, uh, German companies are more, I would say, present on, uh, on the suppliers of equipments, uh, yep. especially uh, where we are, where we having many, you know, in the IPPs where we have many of the man engines uh, that are on some IPPs, okay? Then, uh, uh, then I would explain probably for, uh, if you, uh, later 
how we see in the post COVID, uh, you know, having a, a really strong relation or stronger, I would say, cooperation and relationship between our local SMEs and uh, some German SMEs. I would just uh, give you the stats that in Senegal, we have uh, three person, 2000, I would say, uh, uh, major companies out, out of 400,000 uh, companies that are registered in Senegal. So the rest are more SMEs and informal sector. And I think that there is a good initiative right now and funding to have, you know, uh, uh, SMEs uh, being more resilient and being also uh, 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 having access to the financing. That's the purpose of the Compact with Africa. That is correct. Absolutely. Um, I think you've mentioned Compact with Africa twice. Um, um, I don't want to speak on behalf of the German government, so I will, I will pass on the definition of the Compact with Africa. But do you think uh, it has been successful so far? Do you, do you wish that some things could still be improved, especially with uh, COVID-19 being around? It's obviously also a, a bit of a reset button for many uh, projects and initiatives to say, okay, let's, let's hit the pause button. Let's, let's uh, do an introspection of what has worked, what has not worked. So in other words, now you have the platform here, how would you, uh, um, what would you address to German investors and German in interested parties from Germany coming into Senegal, but Africa as a whole, what, what, are, the, what are the things that need to be possibly improved going forward in a post-COVID world, from German side in particular? Um, it's, a, it's, not, it's, it's a question uh, which is very interesting because so far, what we're trying to do is to improve the business uh, environment in Senegal. Uh, as you can see, you know, Senegal has uh, uh, done giant, giant steps, I would say, in the doing business. And right now is seeking to be uh, under, uh, part of the 100, you know, uh, top reformers. The second, the second thing is uh, for this uh, business uh, uh, to be more attractive, uh, we have to ha to take certain reforms. That's the purpose of the first, let's say, batch of uh, discussion we had with BMZ in uh, in Germany uh, to finance, and we received through a grant, thanks to uh, uh, the German uh, government, through a grant of 108 millions of of, of euros, you know, to uh, implement those reforms. So those are major reforms that I believe that once uh, they are achieved, it will. It will it will it will make easier the the investment for 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 foreign companies. The second thing is uh, we are working right now at the Ministry of Economy on a new law of PPPs. So for us, uh, having the second phase of the Plan Senegal Emergent is is more focused on private sector development, and the PPP law right now that we are working on also is to bring uh, a, a frame. Uh, in Senegal, which, which bring more, uh, uh, let's say, clarity and more transparency and, and, and help all those investors, you know, to feel comfortable investing in Senegal. So I think these are the major changes that we are trying to bring right now and uh, put on the table. And I believe that uh, uh, German companies, even though they are more focused right now on renewable energies, I believe that with the post-COVID uh, uh, recovery economic uh, recovery economic economic plan. Right now, we're talking about roughly of an investment around fourteen thousand billion of US of uh, of CFA. Sorry, uh, in the next uh, four, five years. Okay, so I believe that this is uh, it means that all sectors right now are eligible to uh, uh, investment coming from German companies. So basically, uh, I believe that we have to do also our homework on our side to take those uh, strong uh, reforms to uh, uh, make our business environment more, more attractive so that we can have uh, more investors coming, coming over here. But once again, to recall, no exclusivity and no exclusion. This is very important. I was going to mention this, but this is fantastic really. And I think uh, uh, it, really, it really sums up very nicely what, st what Senegal stands for. I mean, I, I'm not Senegalese. I've been to Senegal very few times. I don't know so much about your country yet, but uh, the reputation often precedes you. Um, uh, Senegal's reputation, I think, is, 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 is highly, highly regarded and is, is growing by the day. And I think it's uh, thanks to the work of uh, 
of, of, of people like yourself. So thank you, Mr. Director General, for the uh, very, very uh, enlightening uh, comments. Uh, we shouldn't forget, no exclusivity, no exclusion. Um, I see there's a lot of uh, questions coming in through the chat, but we'll attend to this later. Um, uh, the, minister, the Mr. DG just earlier mentioned uh, PPPs. I think this is obviously something that uh, on our panel we have to, we have no choice but to hand it over to Siemens and Mrs. Tifase, um, because obviously this is uh, one of the sectors I believe she's, she's extremely active in. Um, and I'll hand over to Anin to do some of the moderating. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, Ms. Chifase, what impact has the pandemic had on Siemens's operations as a major industry player? So, uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, really a pleasure to be here. I think these are the times for us to have stimulating conversations such as this. And we need to recognize the contributions of countries like Germany to um, the development and growth of Africa. Um, in Nigeria, uh, Siemens Energy Nigeria, we've been in Nigeria for 50 years. In fact, uh, 2020 marks our 50th year anniversary in this country. And we faced ups and downs in that period. Um, we faced uh, economic crisis, a security um, crisis as well, and financial crisis in the markets. And still we're here standing. So the pan I would say we were quite prepared for the pandemic to some extent. What we were not so familiar with us, I think, with other organizations was the impact on completely shutting down businesses, um, uh, the lockdowns on travel the restrictions, and um, the inability to return to a normal work mode of operation. Um, so what we found from the more operational sense is that we have had to, um, of course, shift to completely working from home. Um, we have still not returned to the office, unlike some businesses in the country. Um, while we assess the development of the pandemic in Nigeria, uh, we have also had to, um, for where we provide services to oil and gas companies and other clients, we've had to uh, make do with our own local resources. So thankfully we have trained specialized uh, real service re representatives in Nigeria who are able to provide services and we've had to be very creative how we deploy them. Um, we've also uh, had to return to carrying on a, lo on a lot of meetings online. So uh, no face-to-face -face, uh, is the role and uh, most interactions now are remote. So um, submission of documents to uh, partners, to customers, everything has been done um, electronically. Um, but looking at that also, how it has affected our customers and, and therefore us, uh, many of our customers, especially in the oil and gas industry and energy space have uh, faced significant cost pressures um, they've reduced their capex, so uh, reduced capital expenditure in the um, in in many industries. Uh, we're seeing many of them come to us requesting for extreme, um, uh, massive discounts on the same products and services we were supplying before, and that has translated to us also um, having to really optimize our operations and um, be very creative about how we still supply these services at a competitive rate. So, um, and any company that can extend their receivables is doing that. So also we're facing a lot of uh, challenges with regards to recovering uh, payments. Um, but the, this is the side I think where, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's part of, it's not business as usual, but it's, uh, these are where we can handle with the processes we have in place. So we are a multinational, we are um, one of the largest companies in the world, and we do have systems in place for managing these sorts of challenges. I think the ones we weren't prepared for and we, I think we fantastically adapted to was working remotely. We're now where even Siemens has um, issued a, an announcement saying we will never return to the same way of working before. And now we'll uh, generally have all Siemens organizations working two to three days a week um, um, from home. So telecommuting, and that will become the standard for the future. So uh, we're also seeing we're more clued in to people's emotional and well, mental well-being. And this was a tough period for most people. Everyone knows of or is related to someone who has been ill or affected by the pandemic in some way or the other during this period. And it's unlocked a lot more caring, I would say thought provoking uh, conversations with, with employees. So our town halls right now are very interesting. So it's, um, I think it's had its good side. People are doing a lot of online training. So we've sent out polls and, um, um, and we've, we've gotten feedback that employees are learning new skills, uh, digital skills for the future, 
um, they are bracing themselves to, to be able to develop more capacity and, and that will prepare us for the post-COVID world. And, and generally, we're also able to um, now rely on local resources. So there is the benefit that uh, from for supply of services and goods, we're looking at local alternatives. And I think this is also a very positive development. So there, there's plus pros and cons. I think more pros, uh, the more you adapt to it and it becomes create a, a, a new way of working and new way of relating with customers, with clients, with other stakeholders. I think it's, it's, a, it's the new world we're entering, a new era, and being prepared really counts. Um, no, it absolutely is a new world that I think everyone is um, going into. So just keeping a, a post-COVID world in mind, what future prospects do you see for German companies in the African market? As we move into a post-COVID world, a lot more things are done remotely. For, so we celebrated um, one of our first remote um, final acceptance tests, our remote F FATs. This was done uh, via video link with a customer and that went successfully. We're doing a lot more remote diagnostics of, for services um, to various customers as well. So things are moving more to a digital platform, to cloud-based services and, uh, and also financial transactions are being carried out more online. I mean, that has been the norm for some time, but I think this will grow even uh, more intensively and the FinTech arena will become very exciting for companies in that area. Uh, for us as well, we're seeing where the digitalization of the automation of industry is even more important. So less human intervention, more reliance on robotics, um, more reliance on machines um, and artificial intelligence. And, and using that to enhance operations, uh, reduce costs, optimize availability. And um, so it's, it's, it, it has pushed us more towards a digital era, even uh, looking at the effects on public sector as well. Public sector, we're not usually, we're not um, able to carry out meetings face to face. And we saw some public sector officials who hadn't been able to, um, uh, were, were previously having only face to face meetings, um, transition very smoothly to having um, um, online meetings and carrying out a lot of transactions remotely as well. So it, it, it's, a, it's the norm, but uh, I think what we have in Africa is a unique situation where people are desperate for change. They're desperate to develop themselves. They're, they're absorbing information as, 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 as where it becomes available and they're, they're pushing, they're now more vocal about the, the drive to develop the nations, um, uh, the drive to develop themselves and to add value as individuals or for their own businesses. And that's pushing us to an era where I think um, we will become more innovative in developing our own solutions or in um, leveraging those that are available on the global sphere. Great. Um, so you mentioned uh, digitalization. So with, with Siemens targeting digitalization across the continent, um, how can the adoption of smart technologies drive economic growth and entry opportunities for international companies? like ours where we say um, our portfolio is very much around electrification, automation and digitalization. The opportunities are obvious. We supply control systems, um, automation systems in the energy industry. We provide supervisory control and data acquisition, um, protection and control equipment. Um, we're very strong in um, automation of metering systems. Um, it's, so that's uh, it's a, the opportunities that are immediately available. Um, on top of that, we're also training people and we're seeing many companies um, crop up. So I think for the companies that are invested in training of uh, youth and training uh, young people in the utilization of digital technologies, there's massive opportunities out there. Also for adoption, as I said, of fintech, um, not just in industry, but looking um, um, coming back into industry as well. So automation of production lines. Um, doing a lot of things remotely, like I said, as well. So for German companies that, who are in the high tech space and um, have, have, have found a way to create those same success stories in other con advanced countries, I think now really is the time to transition to Africa. Uh, there, there are countries now that are opening the, their borders. Now with the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement as well, we're seeing a push to be more industrialized. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a hope for Nigeria to be able to a net exporter, not a net importer. So that's the threat we're facing as Nigerians. And, and, it's, uh, and, and this can be done without digitalization. I think um, we're all coping with waves of the pandemic where it's, um, there's no, uh, we're seeing improvement. So um, um, the, the flattening of the curve and then re resurgences. 
So it's not clear if we'll ever return to a time when we don't need to um, operate remotely, communicate remotely, and, and that will affect the way things are done in other industries as well. So really now is the time for German companies to leverage the expertise, the know-how, the technologies they've developed um, um, in other um, countries and start to collaborate with private sector and even public sector in, in, in Africa to get um, um, new, new opportunities developed. Um, what gives German companies a competitive advantage in meeting Africa's needs in the areas of power supply, industry, transportation, and healthcare? First of all, we have the right technologies, we have the know-how, we have the experience, but I think the edge ultimately is around planning. Uh, Germans are meticulous for, um, before entering into a venture, we spend more time um, planning, understanding what needs to be done, collaborating with those individuals, um, exchanging information. And, and, and when you see GIZ's activities in Africa, I think that's a very good example. But it's the same with German companies in Nigeria, I mean, Africa, and in Nigeria in particular, doing a lot of pilot projects, proof of concept, um, feasibility studies, and, and, and where, where what, what does that, what, why is that an edge? The edge is that we're able to avoid making mistakes that have been done in the past. I think for, um, for us in Nigeria in particular, we're not keen to um, jump into projects that have been poorly planned. They sound great on paper, but we know they're not implementable or achievable. Or in the end, they're white elephant projects. So it's, it's about planning, being meticulous about why are we doing this? What is the benefit? Uh, what does it require? Do we have the necessary resources? Um, how do we leverage the financing instruments that are available? I think this is really where the value add is. And then on top of that, a lot of projects, when you leave them behind, who runs them, who operates them, who, who maintains those assets? We're also very strong in vocational training and ensuring that there's the operational experience is in country, not trying to ship people from abroad um, like some other countries do, but making sure that the local, um, 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 the citizens of that country are properly trained and experienced on how to operate and maintain that um, technology and, 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 um, and in a sense multiply the benefits. And I think, so these are some of the edges also, the, the, some, some of the edge that German companies have over others. And apart from that, I think also the German government's in, interest in developing Africa. So uh, over time, um, there have been various initiatives for Africa and um, really targeted at creating a more enabling environment. So not just jumping into developing infrastructure, but creating and supporting governments to create the right policies um, to have the right um, um, a framework to attract the right kind of investment, starting with small and medium enterprises, but also looking at how multinationals and others can collaborate with private and public sector in Africa. Oh, great. Thank you so much for those uh, interesting insights. Um, Ken, is, Ken is clapping in the background on your comments from Siemens side, but I have to, I have to console you, uh, Ken. Um, I would like to uh, now jump straight to His Excellency, the Minister, who has joined us from uh, Malabo, Equatorial Guinea, His Excellency Gabriel Mbaga of Yang Lima, Minister of Mines and Hydrocarbons of the Republic of Equatorial Guinea. Uh, sir, it's an honor to have you amongst us. You are, uh, as I always call you, a German-African champion. From the very beginning, you have supported our initiatives and I'm deeply thankful for that personally, but also obviously the uh, Germany Africa Business Forum as a whole. Um, I would like to give you uh, the opportunity to elaborate a little bit on um, where Equatorial Guinea stands today, uh, what, uh, what, what challenges you face in the midst of COVID, uh, and obviously uh, how German companies have helped in the past, we can talk about this later, and what you expect, and I know you are very candid about these things, what you expect from German investors going forward. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Sebastian, and good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to start apologizing both to all the panelists and the participants on this webinar for being a little bit, I'm not late. I just forgot that we have a time change. And this technology <laughs> makes you believe that we all have the same hour. So I completely forgot that South Africa and Germany have one hour uh, in, this time, yes. <laughs> in Equatorial Guinea. So I was actually watching my Bloomberg and then I realized that, oh my God, <laughs> I have a webinar. You so, spend the time <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, Sebastian and all the panelists, first of all, 
I would like on behalf of the Republic of Equatorial Guinea, the Ministry of Mines and Hydrocarbons to thank for inviting us to this webinar, Germany, Africa. I am a great pressure for me to, to represent my little country. We are a very small country, but with big ambitions. And for us to be able to be able to represent and give a keynote speaking is, is a great pleasure. So with that, um, I would first of all, would like to say that, uh, um, of course, I would like to say, make some comments about Africa and German cooperations, but uh, like everybody knows, I focus on the people who pay me, and this is the Republic of Equatorial Guinea. So I'll talk more about Equatorial Guinea and Germany cooperations. And first of all, um, to be very blunt and, and realistic, and everybody's aware, and first I would like to start regarding the impact of COVID-19 to Little Equatorial Guinea, to Africa. We have been all witness on how this is going to be a game changer for our industry, for our economy, for our continent. Uh, but at the same time, I have been very clear to, to a lot of people that whenever you, have a pro whenever you have a problem, you always have an opportunity too. And for ourselves, for example, oil and gas, we have all these experts that they were running away, uh, afraid that they will be infected by COVID-19. And we have to operate our own installations. And then now, of course, now they realize that we have a better testing equipment that some Europeans and in America and they want to come back. So we are getting them to, to, to do a lot of testing before they come back. But it has been a great opportunity because, for example, uh, Total Equatorial Guinea and ExxonMobil um, and the FTSO were actually operated by Equatorial Guineans. They have to manage and they were just doing by video conference, talking with Houston, talking with the rest. And it was realized that a lot of the people who have been working for a long time Axel, Axel, have the, the know-how and have uh, the, the possibility to run that. So that was, in a way, a good test for us. But at the same time, um, regarding the topics that we are here today, it's about, of course, the, the cooperation with Germany. Uh, I think Germany, um, in Equatorial Guinea, we don't have too many examples. We have two examples that we feel very proud. Uh, in the city of Malabo, we do have a facility that actually receives gas and transforms that gas to CNG. And that CNG is, is used for the bus transportation. So whenever we have a conference in the city of Malabo, in Sipopo, we move people through the city through those buses. So again, that's something that very few African countries have done it. That has been done by the German technology, by a German company who did it. And we are still actually have that equipment. But that was not the only project. We actually are developing at this moment, probably one of the first small scale LNG terminals. This has been built in Akoga. And the idea is that uh, we do export LNG. We export LNG to Asia, to Europe, to the United States, uh, to Latin America. But it was a pity because we realized that we could not deliver LNG to any African countries. And the only reason was because there's no African countries who have a terminal to receive ships at that scale. So rather than focus on looking for the terminal, we went to countries like Ghana, we went to Cote d'Ivoire, we went to Togo, and we all discussed the possibility to build a small scale terminal to be able to send small ships of LNG. And we came to the conclusion that to convince people to do this, you have to do it yourself. So we decided that to put in place in the continental part, because for people who are not familiar with Equatorial Guinea, we are, we, the capital is in an island, and the majority of the population is in the mainland. Uh, I don't want to talk about why the Spaniards decide to do that, but that's, uh, that's history. And the, the gas is in the island, so what we wanted to do is to transport LNG from the island all the way to the mainland. And we selected a German company, or German technology, that hopefully, uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we have a delay, we will be able to deliver small scale LNG from the island all the way to the mainland to supply to a 48 megawatt plant generating plant, and at the same time, the boiler for a cement plant. So if we are actually successful with this, we'll be one of the few first African countries who have actually a small scale LNG terminal, and it will be done by German technology 
And, and again, this company has been very good with us and it's a good example. Now that's not the, our only plan. We do have a very, like I already told you, we are small, but very ambitious. We have a major project we call it Gas Mega Hub. Equatorial Guinea is in the middle of the Gulf of, of Gulf of Guinea. And we are surrounded by other producers like Nigeria, like Cameroon, uh, even Gabon in the south, and, and even Angola on the, uh, on the uh, Anobon area. And we do believe that there's many producing countries who are actually born in the gas. So we have designated a, a new project, we call it the Gas Mega Hub, in which not only we are actually capturing the gas from a gas field and taking it to Punta Europa, and this is the onshore, we are actually bringing gas from other fields. And again, the same thing than LNG, rather than do it with the neighbors, with the rest, we decide to do ourselves. So what we have done is we are capturing gas from another field. This is a field by Noble Energy, building a pipeline and bringing it all the way to Punta Europa. And then our LNG plant, methanol plant will be receiving from two fields, the Alba field and the Alain field. Now, we are very pragmatic and in our pragmatists, we don't like to be too theoretical. And to prove this, what I'm talking about this Alem project is not a planned project, it's already under construction. Right now, the, probably next week, we will start putting the pipeline and offshore by, uh, by Noble Energy and Saipeng with the aim that by the end of this year, with the grace of God, and also with, uh, in this case, uh, the, the technology of today, we should be able to conclude the final connection in the end of this year, the connecting of Allen will be able to be there and hopefully first quarter next year we'll be having the first production from two fields. Uh, but again, we are not stopping there. We have uh, awarded a contract to a British company called Gas Strategy that is doing a full master plan, not only on the gas research in Equatorial Guinea, but also in Nigeria, in Cameroon, and possible in Gabon. The objective is to be able to prove that there is enough resources in the region to be able to utilize our infrastructure. Now, I explain all this because again, I wanted to talk how the German engineering, the German technology can be involved. And this is actually how, because we need to make sure to attract investors and know how in technology to be able to help us in this situation in bringing additional gas. We don't want to bring gas just to do power and LNG. There is a lot of more things that you could do gas. You can use for urea plant, you can use it for boiler, for industry. So again, it's very important to bring different, I'll call it projects or use of that gas. The other beauty that we have is that we already have a stranded gas discoveries. We have in the Safiro field where ExxonMobil is, we have the cap gas that has been reinjected, but also flare gas. The same time we have a field, an area, well, a block uh, called, is now called EG27. It was the former of field block R, that it was a gas condensate discovery. Now the difficulty is that uh, this is a dry gas. So we need to be able to bring it via platform all the way to Punta Europa. Uh, and again, that's more both technology and investment that is required, especially for, for gas utilization. Now, and this is not the only thing that I believe that uh, we could do or we can provide to some German interested party. But at the same time, the human resources are very important. We do have an Institute of Technology that uh, we have been training all our operators from there. We are using that the Institute of Technology to transfer some of our workers from oil to be able to train to go into mining. And this is critical because we do believe that the future of Equatorial Guinea it is not oil and gas, it is processing, especially mining processing. And this is why we are focusing on making sure that we could have additional LNG, gas, power, because one thing that is required for processing, it is energy and energy, you need to have cheap energy to be able to have a good value from the, the product. So we are planning to, to use uh, those, the human resources and the gas for processing, especially mining. And, and again, that technology from, from again, Germans, uh, European, American is more than welcome because we need to make sure that uh, we don't just uh, generate revenue, but we generate jobs. Because at the end, this is clearly 
the key objective that as government in Africa, we need to focus at this moment. It is not to be able to fill the, the, the treasury with funds, but it's to create the jobs. If we do not create the jobs, we will be doomed. That's clearly the, the, the reality. Africa and African countries, for us to go away from this pandemic, we need to create jobs. If, for example, you have president like uh, President Trump, he's, he's loved by his country for one reason, he creates jobs. You know, people, a lot of people will like him for different things, but one thing that he's doing, he's creating jobs. Maybe some people like him, people don't like him, but the key thing, the job creating is the key thing. So what we need to do, we can do a lot of structured finances, we can do a lot of adjustment on budget. What is going to count at the end for African countries is how much jobs you can create for your people. So again, this is why we believe that that technology of transferring is very important because you make more money not exporting the products, but transforming the products. So again, I believe that's what, uh, again, this forum, this German African forum should focus. There is a great opportunity, not only for Equatorial Guinea, for the continent, and clearly the resources are here. We just need to make sure that we have the technology to transfer those, uh, transform that resources for final good. So again, uh, this is what I was supposed to be saying at the beginning. I apologize to say it now. And if anybody upset, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm never late. This is one of my few times. So I feel very uncomfortable about that. But the important thing again is that uh, we do believe there is a great opportunity for the German technology. Uh, the only thing that I could say that I have to be very blunt about it, I have been not liking about Germans. It is the same thing than Russian is that they are too shy. They are too shy. I mean, the Chinese, the American, they are very aggressive. They go and they say exactly what they want. The German, they are always apologizing. Sorry, sorry. You have to be very straightforward. We will tell you what we want. You will tell us what you want. We get a deal, we move forward. This is why the Chinese are very good in Africa. They come very forward and they say what it is. And that's why they get the business, the resources. And that's what the Germans need to do. They need to be forward with us. They say, listen, we don't only want the resources. We want this from this, and we will tell them what we want. We sign a deal and we we'll move forward. So with this, Sebastian and everybody, I want to thank you for giving me this great opportunity to represent my country, the continent, as the only, only minister here. And at the same time, I hope that this is not the last webinar between Germany and Africa. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And uh... But thank you very much. And you know, I've always been a great supporter of uh, what your country has achieved in such little time. You know, I've, I've lived in, in, in Malabo myself for, for quite a bit. And uh, every time I come back, the progress is uh, very amazing. And uh, your relentless leadership, I think, in the, in the ministry is... <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if we see a urea plant uh, uh, going forward. And I think uh, that's maybe also... I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. And I wrote an opinion piece on this a couple of years back. The Germans tend to be a little bit too, uh, like you said, shy, inert, I say. Uh, but I think the, uh, the, the very matter-of-factly way of doing business, uh, the way Germans like to do it, is to some extent appreciated in Africa. It's like the no-nonsense kind of philosophy, if you may call it that way. And I think uh, German companies shouldn't be shy about that. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, what I always see for Equatorial Guinea, and I know you are a big supporter of this, uh, producing producing uh, manufactured petroleum goods, whether it's uh, urea or fertilizer plants in that sense. And hopefully there, there, there will be more interest also going forward. Uh, and we see Equatorial Guineans going to Germany to do a degree uh, and work together with a German uh, pet chem company, coming back home and building, I mean, German industry is, is famous and world renowned for petrochemical business. and. Um, I think it will be a pity if that goes to the Americans and the Chinese again. And <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully we see more action on that. And uh, I thank you very much for, for, for taking time. Um, Sebastian, we have a say, I think it's in Spanish say, uh, that the baby who doesn't cry doesn't get the milk. So yes, the that is very need to be able to tell what they want. So we're gonna <laughs> share some of the milk. Thank you, sir, thank you. All right. Um, Shall we uh, move on, Anin, uh, with the GEA group? I think that'll be a very interesting uh, perspective from the uh, manufacturing side of things, which we just uh, touched on here for Equatorial Guinea. Great, yeah, let's get into it. 
Um, Mr. Reed, um, how has GIA managed to adapt its business to global changes introduced by COVID-19? Good afternoon. Before I get into that, uh, maybe just say good afternoon to my fellow panelists and all the attendees. It's a, it's a really great honor to be here today with you guys and share some of our perspectives. So with regards to the question you asked me, um, yeah, you know, I think we're not unlike a lot of European companies. Um, our number one priority, and I'm pretty sure that this is the case for most companies, is our employees. Um, so health and safety, of course. So very early on in the pandemic, we created a global crisis organization uh, and we implemented very strict measures regarding personal hygiene, social distancing, and site access control, of course. Uh, and also uh, from a working mode perspective, like many other companies, uh, Gaia enjoyed a very strong IT-based business environment before the pandemic and then into a working from home mode, which has become the, 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 the standard phrase now in day-to-day -day life, um, was quite easy for us to do and, and is proving to be quite effective. Um, also, on a, on a more uh, uh, serious note, uh, Gaia anticipated, or we anticipated, that this uh, pandemic will no doubt have some sort of effect on our revenues, uh, albeit to a lesser degree, and we're seeing that in our half-year results, uh, because we have a large portion of our revenues which come from the food industry, which of course is somewhat more uh, bulletproof, as it were, to this sort of environment, as opposed to when you compare it to people in the the, um, the travel industry, for instance. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and on a more serious note, as I started saying, uh, Gaia has also introduced a freeze on salaries. So, so all the employees are on board with, with what's potentially going to happen as a result of the pandemic. Um, on a more customer-centric uh, basis, the way our companies have been set up around the globe and, and, and the company that I represent, Gaia Africa, uh, it was set up some years ago that we have local warehousing and we have local resources. I was very happy to hear uh, Mrs. Tafasi say about the need to ensure that we have local expertise. And, and I think other panelists joined in on that. So that this has been our vision and our strategy for, for many years now. So in terms of the, the global supply chain, we were very, a, a very small effect mainly in the form of elevated uh, costs for freight in, in terms of the supply chain. But we, we have local warehousing, we have local resources, and the, the ongoing support to our customers, mainly in the form of uh, after-sales service, uh, keeping the plants running that produce the food, uh, this has not been affected that much. I, coming back to, to that uh, local presence, uh, I think it's, 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 it's what's proven to be very uh, effective during the pandemic is we being part of this food sector, we form part of what is, what is termed essential services. So even in the most stringent level of lockdown, we were still enabled to, to serve our customers. Uh, which, which was a huge uh, grace for us because it ensured that we have a, at least some consistent level of revenue throughout the pandemic. Um, you, you mentioned some challenges uh, when it comes to adapting um, in, in the uh, global business world. Um, what, what factors are currently impeding the development of African manufacturing and processing capabilities and how can these factors be mitigated? Yeah, that's a, it's a very nice question, good question. I, you know, when we, when we consider this, uh, I would like to maybe answer it in two, two, two parts. First of all, why would people consider entering the African market? And, and if you look at the global mega those including the, the enormous growth in the, the world population, 
uh, the associated increase in urbanization levels and the increase in middle class demographic changes as a population as a whole we're all getting older we're all living longer uh, and and the demand of course for for healthier food and better food lo more long life food uh, all of these are in support i don't know if any of the fellow panelists have ever read the mckinsey report that they that they published not so long ago but they they came out and they said well can you actually afford to ignore Africa? If you look at the, the labor force, and I, and I heard a number of my esteemed uh, panelists say, this, say similar, labor force in Africa is expected to exceed that of China by 2040. Uh, the return on foreign investment is the highest in the world currently. Uh, also, a significant availability of land for agricultural production is the, 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 the biggest availability of land is a combination of that in South America and Africa. So I, I think, you know, all of these factors, if we're looking for a why, together with obviously the costs in European based uh, and other first world countries involved is 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 becoming very expensive and 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 i would go as far as to say that from an african context it often becomes unaffordable so so addressing the answer to that question in the form of a, another question so that addresses the why the advice we would give is is definitely be very aware of the differences between africa and and first world norms let's say uh, I think one of my panelists, uh, I had a little chuckle, he mentioned that things sometimes take a little bit longer in Africa, so that, that would be a cautionary note for, for people considering coming into Africa. Uh, the actual market size, uh, when, when you use the, the criteria used for establishing uh, market size and therefore inevitably how much money you're going to invest, those those calculations should should be adapted to the reality. I think a very uh, pertinent point is this: the shortage of skills. And and I think my the right honourable Mr. Limo stated just a moment ago the need to create jobs. Um, but I think equally the the need to enhance skills and develop the young people of the of the continent is is absolutely critical to the success of the, the, the continent and the collaboration between company and Africa as a whole. Uh, of course, the, the, there's other less attractive uh, attributes of Africa that need to be taken care of, uh, and those being things like corruption, state-owned enterprises, and, and possibly uh, the need for better corporate governance in some some of these institutions and then of course in all of our lives we deal with the reality of the the, the highly volatile uh, foreign exchange market and the the, the 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 volatility in all of our currencies whichever country we, we find ourselves representing here today i think uh, another advice which i mentioned uh, a moment ago is the you need to invest in a local presence. I, I really enjoyed the statements earlier where people said, uh, my fellow panelists uh, made reference to the fact that we, we need to create jobs and we also need to use local people. I agree and believe in this. Uh, you, you, you have to contribute to the development of Africa if you're going to participate in the economic development of it. So a local presence, uh, and and these should be staffed as much as possible with local people. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Ken. Um, always great to hear also something from the manufacturing side, which is obviously uh, a mainstay of the of the German economy. Um, now, moving over. Um, last but not least. Um, Tim uh, from the Rwanda Development Board. Usually Rwanda is the smallest country in such panels. I think today it's not the case. You're the second smallest only. <laughs> uh, but I think you have a lot to tell us. Uh, uh, Rwanda is obviously uh, 
a country that has enjoyed uh, extremely positive relationships with German investors, Germany in particular, as a, Germany as a whole. Uh, and uh, I think you are uh, uh, you're a witness of that, uh, representing the Rwanda Development Board. Maybe you give us an introduction to what you guys do uh, and how you see or how you have witnessed uh, German involvement, especially from the SME sides in, in Rwanda. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And first of all, let me thank the entire panel for those interesting perspectives and everybody tuning in today. Um, the Rwanda Development Board is really the government institution that is charged with fast-tracking private sector economic growth in the country. And it's a very interesting institution in so far that it has the same political power um, as a normal ministry, but is not confined to any particular sector and is thereby able to coordinate and work on multiple different sectors at the same time. And very often, as many of you would know, it uh, doesn't matter what sector you're trying to invest in, um, the necessary regulations, the issues or the coordination often spans over multiple sectors. So really one of the role is this coordination role. And then the second part that makes that institution quite unique it's, is um, its ability to uh, stay with the investor from start to beginning. So we both have a responsibility in the policy side to make sure that on doing business and other reforms, we're trying to keep the country uh, reforming and uh, improving further. But we also work on the project development that was mentioned earlier that's very often lacking the promotion of those, but also the implementation. Because, and I truly believe that that is not unique to, to Rwanda or to Africa, but there will always be hiccups in the implementation. And so having a trusted government partner in that implementation journey is really key. And we've seen quite successful to not only attract investment, but actually convert it and uh, create the jobs and the exports that we're really craving for. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, let's go into this a little more in detail. Uh, you work a lot with uh, German companies in the Rwanda context. What are the critical issues that are being addressed coming into Rwanda, investing in Rwanda together or alongside the RDB? What are the, what are the topics uh, or the potential points of frustration that you hear most often? Because by you uh, uh, giving us this answer from a Rwanda perspective, it will also help in other countries uh, because Rwanda is often seen as some kind of role model in terms of, let's say, a uh, rapid uh, development. Um, I think one, one point that we hear very often in terms of um, concern, especially from German companies, but I would assume that that is even more applicable to the Rwandan case due to its size than to other countries, is really the small market size. So I think if you investing um, on the continent, and in, in particular in Rwanda, you're not investing only in a consumer market. You have to think about it strategically um, as a regional investment. You have to think about it strategically as an export investment, a location from where you can export. So very often with many of the German companies, um, it's sometimes the other way around that they actually try to come in and just sell products. And I fully understand that that is um, for many a good first step into, into a market and into getting to know the continent or country. Um, it really is something, I think if you turn that around and you think about from where can you add value in the market, you very quickly are getting a lot more traction and those markets start to look a lot more attractive. So for example, we are currently talking to a Swiss uh, German company uh, in the business of producing medical supplies. Um, they jumped on the opportunity to come to Rwanda and to set up, um, or ho hopefully set up um, a manufacturing part, a plant for FFP2 or N95 masks in the country, really trying to take advantage also of the African Union portal that allows all African countries to collectively source medical supplies. And so I think thinking about Africa, not only as a consumer, but actually as a producer and contributor um, is 
a key uh, change in mindset that will allow you to see a lot more opportunities than you could otherwise see. Fantastic. And what is the, uh, to cut it short, what is the one thing uh, that uh, you would uh, recommend to um, other nations emulating the Rwandan model? I know that's difficult because every country has a different, uh, has, there's a different scenario for every country, but what do you think was the one, the one thing uh, uh, to say, this is, this has really helped to, uh, to kickstart Rwandan growth following the terrible incidents in the 90s? I think the most, the single most important um, is a political vision and a political vision and a clear understanding what do you want from the private sector. Once you really know and have that political vision laid out, it's then all in, in the implementation, making sure you align your, your institutions in that way that they can deliver on that. And in the second part, making sure that you focus on what fulfills your vision, but what's, what is also um, aligned with what your competitive position is. So way too often you would see only a political uh, vision that is not backed up with facts, what you can actually um, do. And I think aligning those two is, but remaining very ambitious um, is I think a key point to be able to, to fast track a uh, high single digit, if not double, double digit growth. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I think uh, uh, this, this sums up our panel and we have a bunch of questions. So I have to apologize for those which we cannot pick first and foremost. Uh, we can only pick maybe two because uh, I think we are quite advanced in time. Uh, but uh, coming to the uh, topic of ambition and leadership that Tim just touched upon, there is a question uh, from uh, Mr. Leoncio from Apex Industries. Uh, and I think this, uh, this is probably addressed to His Excellency uh, Gabriel and uh, the, minister, the Mr. Director General Manet. Um, maybe uh, we, we leave it to the Minister first to answer and then the DG can jump in. The question is, beyond capital injection, to what extent can German companies provide knowledge and technology transfer through working partnerships and training programs with indigenous firms? So there's a clear focus here on capacity building, I believe. Um, His Excellency, uh, I leave this first to you and then to Mr. Mane. Okay, um, I'm going to try. Uh, you guys hear me okay? Very fine, okay. thank you. Yeah, I do fine. apologize, there's more people in the room right now, so I need to protect myself. Very good, yeah. Things that we need to get used to it. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Leoncio for the question. Uh, definitely, it's, it's going to be a, a great opportunity now. I can speak on, on Equatorial Guinea side. I, I will not be able to be an expert regarding the entire continent. But on the Equatorial Guinea side, there is a great opportunity that that synergy between German companies and Equatorial Guinea could be created. Now, the reason is because this is not a country that is uncharted area. This is not a country that the resources are not there. This is a country who already produce oil, produce gas, produce condensate, produce methanol, produce, uh, in this case, CNG, and at the same time, it's going to start the mining. So that means that you do require a, a lot of technology of transformation. So and you can't just think that you come here and you do everything by yourself. You need to be able to be involved with the national. The other key critical, and again, I'm speaking, representing Equatorial Guinea, is that one of our biggest advantage that our country will have, and probably it's very similar than Rwanda, is that the government of Equatorial Guinea have heavily invested in infrastructure. So when you arrive to a country like Equatorial Guinea, you already have the, the, um, the airports, you already have the ports, you already have uh, the roads, you already have the electricity, you already have the water projects. So again, that really saves a lot to the future investors because they are not, they, they are not thinking of just coming and having to put all this infrastructure. So that definitely is one of our biggest advantage. But the other key thing is that uh, it is very important that those possible German interested, specifically German, they need to understand that uh, one of our biggest assets that our continent and Equatorial Guinea have is the youth. We do have a large pool of very young people, people who also have already gone to university, people who already have the drive to be able to work. 
And that's really an untapped resource that needs to be able to take opportunity. I like, for example, initiative that the German government does. For example, if you go to Germany and you work in, or you study in a university, there is some grants that they give it for, again, Africans or anybody to, to, to learn. And, and that's definitely something that a lot of those youth require. They, they require the technology because we definitely need to move into the primary source of the economy. We need to go into transformating. And the same thing is you come to any African country and we can grow everything. I mean, in our continent, not only Equatorial Guinea, you throw any seed in the ground, after two weeks you go back, it grows alone. But that could be a mango, that could be a pineapple. But what do you do with the mango and with the pineapple? You need to transform it. And to transform, you need to have the equipment and you need to be able to use the equipment. And, and what we have been used for a long time is that you have uh, Europeans and it's not to criticize. You can have Spaniards, Portuguese, British, who already know the continent. They already know, they even eat our own food. They, they eat the pepper soup, the rest they know us. But what do they bring? They bring German technology. And a lot of the Germans use those individuals who are very familiar with us bringing the technology, solar technology, water technology, so I think the Germans need to break a little bit on that and go themselves in the ground, meet those young uh, Africans who are really to do it and, and try to do it. Because clearly, and I have to say that because of history, the German view of Africa is different. And, 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 and in this case, because they see an opportunity, an opportunity that they started. I, and again, I don't want to go into history and the rest because it could, that's a very slippery word, but I have traveled to Cameroon. And if you go to Cameroon and you go to the north of Cameroon, that's one of the places that is more developed in terms of infrastructure, industry. Because the former Germans who were there, they actually left a lot of infrastructure. So again, I, I'm not the one to go into example, but I know what the German technology can do. But again, like I said before, the German need to be less shy and they need to jump into it. You know, if the Spaniard can do it, the Chinese can do it, they're even farther than, than that. The German, you just take a plane, Lufthansa go every, almost every African country, you can go with Lufthansa, hopefully. I hope they, they come back because I have a lot of mileage with them and I want to use that. Uh, but again, the key thing is that uh, they need to be able to, to join together with those African and youth. And I'm not saying uh, because, uh, and again, this is, I, I speak like that all the time. One of the biggest errors that a lot of the investors do is that when they go to a country, they focus on, uh, I would say, uh, historical uh, partners. And these are all the partners. Rather than look for people who actually have gone to university, they speak different languages, they go with the easy ones. So I encourage those German interested parties to, to look for those youth entrepreneurs. And, and Equatorial Guinea is one example, but you have in Rwanda, you have in Nigeria and Cameroon, there are many youth who have a lot of drive, uh, interest to, to build, but they know the technology, they need the technology. And, and I insist that technology is required to transform. And that's what I will encourage them to do and, and, and not to be shy. I mean, the other companies who came to Equatorial Guinea, they did the jobs, they concluded, and they were pretty happy with that. So, so again, that's as much as I could say regarding that. And, they should, like I said, they should venture. And, and I think the example that happened in Rwanda has very good ones, in which many Germans company went there, they did the activities. But uh, again, they, they need to, I insist again, because this is my message, they need to be less shy. They are too shy. They need to come to the continent and, and, and lick the ground themselves, not make other people to lick the ground for them. Fantastic, always very, very refreshing. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, Monsieur Le DG, uh, I will also hand it over to you. I think the topic of local capacity building is extremely important. So I think uh, the audience will be very appreciative of hearing your thoughts from the Senegal side. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, I think the, uh, uh, the minister, the excellency, uh, Minister Lima covered, covered it all already. Uh, we have the same similarities in, in, in Senegal uh, about the use. I will just give you one stat. 65% uh, of the population is under 25 years. So this is something uh, which is at, a, uh, at the same time a blessing, but at the same time a challenge, because each year we have 
between 250,000 to 300,000 people requesting for a job. So the question of, 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 of uh, the uh, training and, and job is very important. And with, uh, mainly with a German, uh, Germany uh, uh, cooperation, today we understood that question uh, a long time ago. And that's why uh, German finance, one of the projects which is very important, the higher education uh, program for renewable uh, energy uh, and energy efficiency that worth around eight, eight millions of euros uh, for the period for, for, from 2015 to 2022. And, uh, uh, and has to date enabled the establishment of two inc incubators and two entrepreneurial uh, spaces equipped and support in development of their strategies and business plan. This is just to help the youth and uh, young entrepreneurs, the startups, also to have a chance you know, to have their project being bankable and have access to financing. The second point I would just address is, uh, while I was talking about Compact with Africa, one of the key reform was uh, the vocational training centers. And currently the head of state is pushing for uh, a, a huge project of uh, 45 uh, new uh, vocational training centers. Uh, this will help also the uh, training and help the capacity for our young people that won't have the chance probably to go to certain universities and have certain grades. So uh, based on this also, I would say we are also in Senegal in the era of oil and gas. Uh, I would just highlight that Senegal has compounded, has compounded annual growth uh, for the last five years of more than 6%. And, uh, and uh, by 2023, uh, we are talking about, you know, uh, having, uh, being, uh, operating this oil and gas that we discovered. So uh, there is a huge need of, uh, uh, I would say capacity building in terms of training for our use. But at the same time, I will just, uh, as I was already explained, uh, KFW and GIZ also is financing uh, many projects in that, in, that, in, that, in that area to train and also to enhance the capacities of the structures that are in charge of those projects. So this is basically what I would just say in a nutshell, but as the minister already said, we have the same, you know, realities all over the country, all over the the, uh, the Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DG. Um, there's one more question here, and I would like to address this to uh, the private sector, uh, Mr. Fasse and, and Mr. Mr. Reed for 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 Siemens and Gea, uh, respectively. And uh, interestingly, it's, it's, it goes very much hand in hand with what we've just discussed. It comes from Tobias to Löwe, SCC Industries. And the question is, how are uh, GEA and Siemens involved in getting training programs, which is in German called the so-called Ausbildung, for the workforce in place, uh, like, uh, like uh, to be assessed, like we know in Germany, the dual training program, how do you, uh, from the Siemens and GEA side, do you see this, uh, these programs, these, uh, these apprenticeships, if we call them that way, in Germany, do you see this being a viable option for the African workforce or is this uh, a bit of a German unique phenomenon or to what extent have you already embraced uh, this, uh, th th these kind of uh, training steps? Yes, Mr. Stefasi, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank my fellow panelists, uh, the Honorable Minister and also the DG um, representing their countries uh, so fantastically. I think highlighting the resource gaps in or the resource opportunities in Africa is very critical also to answering this question you've presented. Uh, in Nigeria as well, there's about 70% of the population below the age of 30. Um, so the question is we have so many resources. I think we've spoken about gas as, well, as a very vital asset for the development of Africa, but also human resources that need to be leveraged to grow the country. And um, it's not enough to just have a stable infrastructure, the right policies, you need to have educated and capable hands to be able to uh, deploy those technologies. So definitely, yes, vocational education is a very important uh, subject for um, private sector and private companies like ours in Nigeria. But before I start, I'd like to say, I've learned one new thing today is that you should cry out really loud and you don't cry, you don't get the milk. 
and uh, being shy and that the world is changing. Um, social media is changing the way we communicate, the way we perceive each other, the way we do business, um, and um, not being bold enough to see the opportunities really is not an accept. What we're doing now is really engaging with the government and, and various forms to first of all resolve very key issues around education, but also around the energy crisis in Nigeria, which all of you know. I mean, I've had to switch off my video several times because of the energy crisis in Nigeria. So now that happens very frequently. If you have a Nigerian on your panel, the person is going to be totally embarrassed because of the energy crisis. But coming back to education, what we've done in Nigeria is that we've, we had a Siemens Power Academy in, um, built by Siemens for Siemens, and eventually we licensed the Lagos state government to run that academy. So now the Lagos Energy Academy is run by the Lagos Electricity Board. Um, it's very, it's thriving. It focuses on development of youth to um, ensure that there's a steady pipeline of uh, ready skills available for the power sector. Uh, we've also collaborated with other governments um, for training of their, um, state governments in Nigeria for training of their employees. Uh, we've had a, a hackathon and established sort of um, innovation hub with the Edo state government in Nigeria. And now we've um, entered into an agreement with the Nigerian government to um, en enhance capacity, power generation, transmission, and distribution capacity to the tune of 25 gigawatts. So operational capacity to the end consumer. And in line with that project, we have a massive training component as well. Training of the employees of the distribution companies, transmission companies, but also training for university students and colleges and um, technical um, colleges to be able to um, hold to be employed on that project in the future. So training is something that we have seen always as a driver for um, economic growth. Without economic growth, there's no win-win. So the reason we have this forum today is Germany and Africa can come together to do more if there is growth on both sides. And um, I think Germ, the, 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 the value we can bring is also sharing not just the technological know-how, um, not just the products or systems, not, not just the digitalization to, um, and, and technologies, but also in how we can develop the youth to be independent, entrepreneurial. And I think it's it, uh, the um, Honorable Minister also said, you need to create jobs, but you need to create the right quality of jobs. You need to create jobs that are, um, that are stable, that are quality jobs, that where skills are required and jobs that ensure that they stand the test of time. As taste change, as demand changes, it's still relevant. So really more high tech um, sort of knowledge and expertise and that's where uh, companies like ours can really play a dif big difference in just not just sharing knowledge, but in building institutions that stand the test of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ken, you want to you wanna add, add to that from Gia's side? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that was very well, well put. You know, we, we, we have a continuous flow of artisanships going through our uh, institution. Uh, we also offer, uh, or not only offer, we insist. When, when we put a new uh, processing plant in place anywhere around the world, we insist that local resources form part of the pre-commissioning, the commissioning, the handover, and ongoing uh, operation of the plant. Uh, there, there's, there are levels of digitalization and, and automation, so, so there's always first level support available. And as I said, we have a local presence, but. The, the involvement of the, the end user and the upliftment of the local resources is absolutely key to, to maintain uh, what was intended for most factories these days have a 30 year at least lifespan. Uh, and we are completely committed to ensure that that, that happens in particular within Africa. All right, um, Anin, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, I believe we have had some wonderful insights. Uh, I'll leave the closing remarks to, to the lady among the moderators. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Um, so we have reached the end of this webinar. Uh, thank you to all our panelists and the audience for joining us today. And thank you, Sebastian, for co-moderating the session. Before we sign off, I'd just like to mention that the GABF will be hosting upcoming webinars. So please look out for those um, and please visit um, aopwebinars.com to register for um, Africa Oil and Power's upcoming webinars. Uh, lastly, you'll be able to find the video of today's webinar on uh, AOP's YouTube channel.
thank you everyone and uh, i hope you all enjoy the rest of your day thank you goodbye thank you. Uh,